pray while we stand. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to worship you as a faith family. Thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the love that you infuse into your believers in a supernatural way to give us what we need, the love that we so desperately need in our own hearts, and also that love that we can share with one another. We praise you, Lord God, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat this morning. Thank you, uh, worship team, so much for leading us in worship of the one true God who reigns above all else. Guys, you, if you'd like, you can turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to be jumping in there. And if you haven't noticed, as Josh had said earlier, there is a potluck today. And I'm willing to wager that uh, there is enough food for every man, woman, and child in this room, plus the 30-some kids that are in kids' uh, ministries right now. So I'm just saying you, you can stay if you want to stay. Now, I'm not going to, like, twist your arm or make you feel bad if you go, but there is food for sure. And I want to thank uh, the ladies who... Uh, are helping with that, the guys who have made so much of the food too. We just want to thank you guys so much, and um, I'm sure we'll have like a standing applause ovation after we eat, because we got to sample it first, right? Like, see what we're really up to here. There is going to be also a men's breakfast coming up Saturday, the 29th at 8 a.m. It's going to be at the Lighthouse Building. This is for any of the guys. Uh, the 29th at 8 a.m., it's a Saturday morning, and uh, it's just going to be kind of a pancake breakfast, and I encourage you if you have any curiosity to meet some of the other guys in the church and just have some fun together, write that in the calendar Saturday the 29th at 8 a.m. We're going to be doing that together. <clears throat> so uh, just for a way of a little bit of review, we are in the book of First Timothy. First Timothy is written by the Apostle Paul to this man, Timothy. It is what is considered a pastoral epistle. There's only, I believe, three pastoral epistles, and these are written from Paul to a pastor. Honestly, they're written to uh, a leader of the church. And it's Paul instructing these leaders to say, hey, uh, I know that in leadership, it can be difficult in leadership. Uh, it can be strenuous at times. It can be confusing at times. And Paul wants to exhort this leader, this is how you lead the church. This is what the church is supposed to look like. And so for all of us, it's really fun to jump in on a leadership letter divinely inspired by God himself to figure out what is church supposed to be like? How's it supposed to go? When God's people gather, what, what things do they hold dear? What things do they kind of press out? What things do they elevate? And what things do they turn from? And one of the things that we find that is major, it's kind of the subtitle for this whole series is this, the goal of our instruction is love. Paul writes that to Timothy. He's like, hey, 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 here's the thing. People could come to church for a whole host of reasons, right? They could get involved with the church ministry for a whole myriad of reasons. But the reality is uh, the goal of our instruction is love. And when we found out that we define love the way that the Bible defines love, if you're reading these words in the Bible, you have to define those words the same way that the Bible defines them. If you define them the way that a, co a culture defines them, you'll define them wrongly or, or possibly define them wrongly. So when you say that uh, the goal of our instruction is love, you, you need to find out what love means biblically. And we find that just rolled out for us so beautifully in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the great love chapter, and throughout the context that God has loved us with an everlasting love, that he loved the world, the broken world, so much that he gave his only begotten son. And so we, we find God's great love for us as one of the most significant things that motivates believers to gather in the history of the world. This is what we're doing. I'm going to get, I can already tell, man, Ben's going to get all pumped up today. I look out. Well, what's minor? The meaningless arguing we find out as we read through it, right? He says, some will turn this aside to fruitless discussions. So that's for him. It's like warning. People will turn aside to these fruitless discussions. And these genealogies and things like that, that's, that's a minor. The major is the goal of our instruction. And also this glorious gospel, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 15, it says, it's a trustworthy statement. We find this little phrase over and over in the pastoral epistles only. It's Paul elevating these statements. He goes, hey, man, this is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I am foremost of all. 
I want us as Christ followers to always remember when we read something in the scripture that pricks us a little bit, that hurts, that we say, man, I don't know if I like that or I do that and, and, and I'm finding out that I'm wrong. It, you get pricked a little bit by the scripture. I want you to remember that Paul writes, I'm the foremost of all sinners, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save us. This isn't some kind of overarching condem condemnation that we read routinely in the scripture. We, we read a God who loves us so much that he tells us the truth, amen? A truth that will heal us and a truth that he is very willing to save us even at times from ourselves. We found uh, Pastor Jeff was preaching in uh, chapter 2, verse 1. First of all, after he kind of outlines that there's dangerous doctrines going on, that the goal of our instruction, and he rolls into, first of all, prayers and petitions and entreaties be made on behalf of all men. He's saying, I want you to be a praying church. And last week we talked about worship, the men lifting up holy hands and the women receiving instruction in quiet godliness. And what this context of this church family ought to be like as we look at it here in 1 Timothy. Now we're going to go into 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to read uh, verses 1 through 7. We're finding out overseers and deacons. He's going to talk about leaders today. It is a trustworthy statement. We're running into it again, right? It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious. We're going we're gonna to define some of these a little bit if you are like me and your eyes got crossed when you read that word, like, what's pugnacious? But gentle. Peaceable, free from the love of money, verse 4, he must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside of the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. What we find in these verses is 15 different qualifications for eldership in the church. 15 qualifications. This is one of those things that when you're reading it and, and it just gets into one of these big lists and, and you always read the lists, but I gotta be honest, sometimes in my mind when Paul stacks up big words like this that are full with meaning, you kind of just say, okay, I get it, like it's a big deal. And you don't really calculate exactly what he's, what he's trying to impress upon us. But the fact is that these are qualifications for leadership. We'll go back to verse one. It says, it is a trustworthy statement. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. To do. What is an overseer, as the text outlines for us? An overseer, it literally means to look intently on. If you break this word down in its essence, that's literally what it means. To look intently on. But there's this aspect of personal visitation or inspection. So you're looking intently on it, but you're, you're visiting it. You're a, you're a part of it. You're inspecting it. It's an office or role where you have a personal interaction with what you're inspecting. It's oversight. It's a leadership role. As you look through the context of Scripture, you see... These words used interchangeably, overseer, elder, pastor, church leader, bishop, depending on the translation. These are all the same. They're all used interchangeably. And it's this idea of looking intently on and being a part of. First point today is this, a fine work desired, which is specifically exactly what he says. And then I'm defining this a little bit, the calling of leadership. A fine work desired. He says, if anyone aspires to the office of leadership or overseer, it is a fine work that he desires to do. It is not wrong to desire to be in church leadership. As I was thinking about that, it seems maybe obvious to some. It's like it's not wrong to, to desire to be in church leadership. 
You ever work at a workplace and you find, you find out that one of your coworkers kind of wants to be the boss and you're like, oh, oh no, oh no, no, I do not want that person to be the boss. That they are aspiring to leadership and you're thinking, oh Lord, have mercy on us, right? We do not, we do not want them. And then sometimes I think we translate that over into the church and, and it's true where we would see people aspiring for church leadership and you go, oh mercy, I hope that never turns out that direction, right? But here's what, what Paul is telling us. He says, here's the thing. If you aspire to church leadership, it is a fine thing that you aspire to do. We got to remember that in the first century, Christian leaders didn't get a lot of extra benefits. You got to put yourself back into the, the context of when this is written. And you think, man, if someone was aspiring to church leadership, you know, for some of us, we think, oh, all these world religions today, and there's these leaders that they take positions of leadership because uh, for nefarious reasons. They want people to worship them. They want to get money because they're going to ask for a lot of money, and then they're going to get money, and they're going to get power and opportunity and all this stuff. And so they're in it for sordid gain. And it's like, well, sometimes people do that, yeah. And sometimes in the old, the, the New Testament church, that would happen as well. But let's remember as well that if you were a leader in the New Testament church, all the apostles were martyred, right? They were killed for their faith. And so it wasn't like they're getting a ton of extra benefit. It's like Paul is writing this. Again, he's, a, he's older now, right? This is towards the very end of his earthly ministry. And Paul is writing this to Timothy, and it's like, yeah, I mean, I've been in jail like multiple times being this church leader. And so he says, if somebody's aspiring to lead this thing, that's a good work that they want to do. I would even say that there was a time in America where being a church leader kind of afforded you extra benefits. But perhaps that time has passed. Where more and more it's like, oh man, the, the radical Christian believer who takes God at his word and says, dude, like convictionally I believe this, is oftentimes ostracized in our culture. It's not so much, it is a place of authority and it is a place of it should be looked highly upon, but often our culture doesn't do that. It says it is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires, this, this idea of aspiration to stretch forward, if any man desires to stretch forward and lay hold of church leadership, to be an overseer, it's a fine work. I want to take another minute or two to just say this. Leading the church is a fine work. I will be very honest with you guys today. Leading a church is difficult, isn't it? You can imagine, leading a church is difficult. Leading Americans, if you would just say that, if you are in any position of leadership whatsoever, in any capacity, in your workplace, in the schools, in any civic organization, you're going to find out leading is difficult. It's like herding cats in America. It's like everybody's just kind of going their own way. You're like, uh, I have a position and a title and a job responsibility that I'm supposed to try to accomplish and Everybody wants to do their own thing. It's tough, isn't it? I had uh, a friend one time, this was some time ago, and I was talking with them, and they were in church leadership at one point. They'd stepped out of church leadership, and they'd gotten a position in, a, again, kind of like a civic organization that they were helping to lead. And they were on a board of leaders. And they went to their first board meeting, and they, there, so there's board members there, and there were some community members and stuff there. And it got a little heated. You ever been in a boardroom where it got a little heated? A couple of people, I'd be like, show of hands. <clears throat> it got a little heated. And after the meeting, someone knowing that this board member was kind of new came up to them and said, uh, man, it got a little heated, you know, sorry about that. You know, how, how, do, you, how do you think things went or how, how are you doing, knowing that they were new to the position? How are you doing? I know it got a little heated in there. And this person smiled with this huge smile and said, Oh, that's nothing. I was in church leadership. Nobody even questioned my salvation or anything. That was nothing. <laughs> church leadership can be tough. All of a sudden, your argument on the color of the carpet turns into like, you don't even believe Jesus is God. Like, dude, like, I just disagree with the carpet. Like, it can be tough. But we're going to take God at his word. And we're going to say when, when the Apostle Paul talks to Timothy and he's like, hey, you know what? It won't be long and I'll be dead because of this faith that I'm believing. And if anyone aspires to lead in this thing, 
It is a fine work that they desire to do. Friends, I'm here to tell you that leading a church and being involved in leadership of a church and helping God's work on earth and just being a small part of it, you get to have a front row seat of what God's doing. Isn't that true? If you've been in any level of church uh, ministry and you sit around with other leaders, kids ministry and men's ministry and ladies ministries and preaching and any of that, and you sit around a table with people and you're in the word together, you get a front row seat at what God's doing. And that, I'm here to tell you, is beautiful. Think about the time that God inter intersected in your life and you're sitting there with his word and maybe you have another believer or two around you and you're like, man, if this is true, I've been living wrong. If this is true, how can I get this into my life? If this is true, how can I be that man, that woman? And you realize that this is a fine work that God is doing inside of the church. We're going to look more at it, but I just think that it's, it's an amazing thing that when we look at church leadership, it would be easy for some of us to say, oh man, chapter 3 of Timothy, it's for overseers and deacons, and this is church leadership. I don't have an aspiration for that, and so I'm going to set that aside and let the people who want to do that be worried about it. But what we know is God is calling all of us to follow him with everything inside of us. And so when he starts laying out these qualifications, we understand that this is what a Christ follower looks like whether they're in leadership or not. And I would ask you kind of a, as, a, as a component of this, what are your aspirations? What do you desire? Do you desire to just be the boss? Do you want to climb the corporate ladder? Do you want more money? Is that the aspiration? What is your aspiration? What do you want? Some people perhaps have almost no aspiration, and they'd say, well, Nothing. I don't, I don't want anything. So you have no aspirations? Is that the right thing? To be a spiritual overseer, to invest into other people, it's a fine task. What are your aspirations in your home? What are your aspirations in this community? When you look into our community, what do you hope would happen? What would you pray for to happen? What would you join in effort and work and sweat equity to see happen. And it is a fine work when the church gets together and labors for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, is it not? And we see that fine work executed and we get to have a front row seat when God starts showing up and working in people's lives. And it's like, dude, this is awesome. And to be sure, we will have persecution at times and hardship and board meetings where our salvation is questioned or whatever. But it's a fine work. The second point is this, an overseer must be. An overseer must be. This is what he says. An overseer must be. So the, here's the importance of character. 15 qualifications for church eldership or overseer. And what we're going to do is I'm going to look closely at a few of these that have contention in them, and then we're going to just like ruse over the rest of them because sometimes preaching a list isn't the most fun but I do want to give a little credence to looking at some of these and considering what they mean and the first one is this to be above reproach to be above reproach everybody say that out loud with me ready above reproach to be above reproach you hear this very often when you have a church leader being questioned in some fashion or form the first thing that usually comes out is dude they're definitely not Above reproach. Here's, here's the problem, and not above reproach. Well, let's look at the word because definitions do matter, and uh, sometimes I think we get a, a characteristic in our mind that may not always be there, but here's the, the word reproach means to find fault with or blame. To find fault with or blame. That's what reproach means. So, got kind of a rhetorical question for you guys today, but. Do you think it's possible in our world today that there can be blame or fault found on any person breathing today? When you go on social media, you could find fault with or blame on anybody. Am I wrong there? To find fault with or blame. Well, here's a question. There was one guy who walked the earth, and he was perfect, right? 
He did never sin. He did nothing wrong. The Lord Jesus Christ. He was, by definition, above repro- reproach. What happened to him? Crucified. Crucified. So my question is this. Like, in our fallen, desperate world, these people and these, in, these leaders that have this aspiration of leadership that are growing in faith and Christ-likeness, they will be get put to the level of being above reproach that no one could find fault with them. Is that even possible in our world today? Uh, That's gonna be a problem. Here's the thing that I want us to know as a faith family that should hold church leaders to the authority that the word holds, holds us to. We are holding these individuals above reproach, but they are not perfect. They are not perfect. Above reproach could be defined well this way, without blame in light of the whole picture. Because oftentimes we will look at someone and say, well, they're all messed up and this is what they did wrong, but we don't see the whole picture. And when we bring other people in and and it's inspected upon, then we get a better whole picture and then those people are removed from the blame or the reproach. This phrase above reproach is described by all the other qualifications. So as we look through this, the reason this is first in the list is because he's going to define above reproach. He's going to just start going down through the list. Above reproach doesn't mean that whatever you want to build into it, it means these are the the next 14 are the criteria that we're going to use to make sure this person is above reproach. The next one is this, husband of one wife. This again, historically, has had all kinds of contention with it. Literally means a one woman man. Does it mean that an elder must be married? That's some of the questions that people ask. Well, if he's a a one-woman man, a one-woman man that does he must must be married? No single men as elders? If that was the case, Paul himself would have been disqualified, right? 1 Corinthians 7, 8, he says that he was single. Does it mean that he can't remarry if widowed? Paul is going to encourage widows in chapter 5, especially the young widows, to remarry. So it's like, okay, there's biblical precedent for remarriage if if one is widowed. What if the elder has gone through divorce? There's biblical allowance for divorce in the scripture. At least two different places, sexual immorality and abandonment allows a person for divorce. So does this mean that the individual who has a biblical allowance for divorce it doesn't say mandate if they've gone through divorce biblically it's like well yeah man that's what happened that's how it went down could they not be an elder what if he wasn't a believer when he got a divorce then he became a believer 15 years later growth and wisdom and knowledge of christ you'd say oh man you got a divorce 15 years ago or whatever it was these are the questions that are raised i i found a really great response to this by Pastor John MacArthur writes this. The issue is not the elder's marital status, but his moral and sexual purity. When it says husband of one wife or a one woman man, this is what we're getting at. His present character. His present character. The elder is known to have a biblical ethic when it comes to sexual purity and morality. He's faithful to his wife. The, The NLT translates it that way. Faithful to his wife. Well, what wife and in what situation and all of the, he says, it's not about your marital status. It's like, are you married? Yeah. Are you faithful to her? Yeah. Do you, are you known in the community for having a, a biblical view on marriage, a precedent that, that permeates who you are, that has been up, upheld for a significant amount of time? You have gained a reputation for upholding a biblical ethic? Then, then it's permitted. And these are kind of case-by-case situations. This is why you'd get the elders together and you'd inspect the person's life and you'd say, hey, great. Let's roll through a couple of these quickly. Temperate or self-controlled. An elder is not to lose their temper. They're not to be known as one who loses their temper. Or self-controlled, that they're not to have a bunch of addictions. Prudent, sensible, lives wisely. They're respectable. They have a good reputation. 
here's a great like kind of benchmark for an elder. If you're telling someone of a, an elder at the church, or if you're an elder at the church and you're telling someone and they are surprised that you're an elder, like, oh, yeah, that person is an elder? The reality is they may not have that respectable, good reputation. There may be something there, right? But a lot of times people will find out and say, oh, you know what? That makes sense. I could see that in that person. They're hospitable. They're able to teach. This is the only aspect that is listed that is a skill and not a character quality. They're not addicted to wines. So they're not an excessive drinker, pug not pugnacious. That means inclined to fight. You know somebody, have you, do you have somebody in your life, and maybe this has been the case with you, I can tell you straight up, when I was young, I was inclined to fight. I love to argue with people about whatever. I'm just like, oh, you said da, 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 da. An elder is not to be that way. They're to be gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money, manages their own household well, not a new convert, and have a good reputation. Let's jump into and continue through the verses. We're going to look at verses 8 through 13. We're going to read the qualifications of a deacon really quickly. Deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own households. Verse 13, for those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing, a great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Quickly again through deacon, what it means to be a deacon, it means servant, a waiter, a, a minister. If you were to break down the word deacon, diakonoi, I thought this was very interesting. It means thoroughly dust. Thoroughly dust. That's what diakonoi means. It means to raise up dust by moving in a hurry and so to minister. When you think about those who serve the church family, that's the, that's the phrase that the scripture uses. It says to to stir up dust because they are serving fervently. They are constantly serving the body of believers. And the New Testament refers to the Lord inspiring his servants to carry out his plans for the people, to do the ministry. This is what deacons do. When you look through, you see very many qualifications of deacons that you also see of elders or overseers. But you see this phrase, and it caught my attention, hold fast to the, the mystery of the faith. Paul uses this frequently. It just means that which was hidden is now revealed. He's talking about the gospel. That in the Old Testament, which was hid, hidden, is now revealed. And when these individuals are confronted with the mystery of the faith, this good news of the gospel that God can save and redeem them through Jesus, they grab onto that and they hold it tightly. They hold onto the mystery of the faith and that the deacons must be tested. This is another thing. It's like, uh-oh, what does that mean? I was never good at tests. Verse 10 says this, these men must first also be tested and then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. This means that you take the elders and as evaluation, as you look through the character criteria and you just say, hey, is this the kind of person that would be a good deacon or deaconess here in the church? The qualifications in verse 11, you can see that the women closely, it, it mirrors closely that of the men. And that they have a great confidence and faith in Jesus Christ as they serve faithfully. And the last thing is this, and this is what I wanted to cruise through to get to. Verses uh, 14 through 16. I am writing these things to you, hoping that to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. I'm going to pause and read that one more time. I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. There's that word mystery again. And then he goes right into the gospel, this creed, this old, this ancient creed. He who was revealed in the flesh, 
vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up into glory. Friends, if you're cruising to sleep now, I want to wake you up. So you will know, he says. I'm writing this so you will know. What's the purpose of this book? He wants the church to know how to act. And this is the influence of the church, the household of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and the support of the truth. If you're taking notes today, just write household of God. God's church reflects a household. Every one of us grew up in a household, right? Raise your hand if you grew up in a household. Everybody, everybody. Now, all of our households were a little bit different, weren't they? They had different character and so forth. But God says, and he wants to relate his church to the household. And we've all grown up in a household, so we know what a household living is like. And we know that it matters. Some of us grew up in very difficult homes. Some of us could say, dude, my household growing up was terrible. Alcohol abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse, moved all the time, cold at night, hungry bellies. Some of us didn't have that experience at all. We had a household that we grew up in, and it was awesome. Mom and dad that loved us, sure, it wasn't perfect, but we were always warm at night and always a full belly. But we understand what a household is, and we understand the significance of the household. And we understand if someone doesn't lead their household well, the dire results that happen there. I want us to consider for a second why Paul would have a list of 15 attributes of the leaders of the household. Because he's saying this is so significant, this is so important. The people who are leading this thing need to be above reproach. They need to be held to a standard. Here's 14 more things you ought to look at to evaluate that. Because when the household goes wrong and when the leaders of the home mess the thing up, the consequences are dire. Everything flies apart, people are hurt. 1 Timothy 3, 5, which is part of our text today, he says, if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the home of God? This is significant. Think of how much that elevates the home. He says, dude, I don't know if they can lead in the church. How are they leading in their home? And you think, really? You know, corporate America basically doesn't care what you do when you're not at work, do they? They don't care one bit. They're like, oh, it doesn't, oh, that's their home life, their private life, that doesn't matter. And I understand that we're not to bring things, you know, from their home into the workplace needlessly. But can I tell you something? Your home life actually tells who you really are. It tells your character. Guys, are you grateful that God didn't just put a list of things that all these to-dos, these are all the things that a Christian leader is to do, all these tasks, he didn't do that. He says, this is who I want the leaders to be. I want them to have this inside of them. I want it to be so ingrained inside of them that this is what it's like when you go into their house. This is what it's like when you go into their friend circles. This is who they are. This isn't a to-do. This is just something that they should be. And I want to elevate again the home. Oh, it doesn't matter what we do behind closed doors. Can I tell you, it does to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it does to your kids if you have kids at home. And can I tell you, it never stays there. It always comes out into the light. What you're doing at home and what you're doing in the community, it follows you to work. It follows you everywhere. It follows you to the boardroom. The Lord Jesus Christ who created you for the task that he made for you, he's saying, I created you in a certain way and I don't want you to just do things rightly. I want you to be new. I love this. And you're part of the household of the faith. Galatians 6.10 says this, so then we will have opportunity, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who are the household of the faith. God says, you're in a family. You say, my family was so messed up growing up, and I would say today, you're in a family. You're in a faith family, and it's not just here at Freedom Fellowship Church. It's a family of believers that goes around the globe. Ephesians 2.19 says this, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens and saints and are of God's household. Do 
You've been adopted into God's household. You're like, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of money or we're kind of poor growing up or whatever. And you think of yourself like down here. The king of kings and lord of lords said, I want you in my family. You're my son. You're my daughter. And as a household, this is how the household operates. And I'm not going to tell you something to do and then say, do as I say, not as I do. Maybe some of us had a dad or a mom like that. No, he's going to say, I'm going to do exactly what I'm telling you to do. I'm going to serve first. I'm going to get down and wash feet. I'm going to come down off the throne. Right? This is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, this is our family. House rules. Right? House rules. This is how it goes here. I love that God has set up house rules. House rules. The church is a family. Brothers and sisters. That is Christian language from the very beginning of this thing. Brother and sister. We could say it as a cliche thing or we could realize, no, it's a brother of a king. It's a daughter of a king. Church moms, church dads. I love church moms. They've meant a lot to me over the years. He has standards. He wants the world to know. He blesses the world through his household. He blesses the world through his households, hospitals, schools, workplace leaders, integrity, moms and dads. The church of the living God is the household of God and is the church of the living God. He is a living God. He is alive. History is full of gods that have come and gone, right? My, friend, my family, we like looking at Roman gods and Greek gods and mythology, and these gods have come and gone, but this God that we serve and worship is alive right now. This church of the living God, the word church is ecclesia. It means to call out. It is the called out ones. We sit here in a church as called out ones. We are not just like the community. We are a cross section of the community that God has called out. He has called us sons and daughters. He has put us in his family and his household. And he says, there's some house rules. Because I love you. And because I want you to be representative ambassadors out into the world. We are the called out ones. We who are living in darkness, he called into his marvelous light. We who are living in our earthly families, he called us into a brand new faith family. And the living God directs his people. 2 Corinthians 6.16 says this, for we are the temple of the living God. We are the temple of the living God. He's coming in and dwelled inside of us and he directs us from the inside. He cleanses us from the inside, Hebrews 9.14 says. He cleanses us from dead works that we can serve the living God. Lastly today, he is the pillar and the support of the truth. The church is the pillar and the support of the truth. I mismanaged some time and I didn't put this together rightly, but I want you to consider the powerful influence of the church in the community. If we believe that this is God's word and God looks down from heaven and says the church is the pillar and the support, some translations say foundation of the truth. Here's a good question. Does the world need truth today? Yes. Where will it find the truth? Can it just, just Google it? Should we go to the leading experts of the day to find the truth? I'm not trying to raise up a bunch of contrarians that just like throw everybody out, but I want to tell you this. God says that the church is the pillar of the truth. And he says that the leaders in the church, he holds to a standard. And he wrote it for everyone because he says everyone ought to hold these leaders to a standard. And he says this. I care about what they do when they go home. And I care about how they act in the community. And I'm watching them 24 seven because I think that character counts more than all of their to-dos. I want them to be the kind of person that they're illustrating to you to be. And he says, the church will change the entire world. And we've seen the church change the world, have we not? You will read garbage in textbooks talking about Christianity dismantling all kinds of things. Higher education is the result of the church. Modern medicine is the result of the church. Friends, I, <laughs> do, do, the, do the research. You can walk through it. We hold up the truth for everyone to see as if on a pillar, 
built on a foundation for all to look upon the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. The truth is the gospel. The truth is that God has loved this world and saves them by shedding his blood through Christ and redeeming this family that he's calling his own. And anyone can be in the family. And then he goes through a creed where he walks through step by step what it means. Revealed in the flesh. He who was revealed in the flesh, that's Jesus. God became flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, is proven, upheld by the Spirit of God, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations. You know, this gospel has been proclaimed among the nations. Church family, let's have everybody stand up. We'll close in a word of prayer. But this is, I want you to consider what it means that it doesn't matter if you're a church elder or leader this morning. We need to know that we, as the church, are the pillar and the support of the truth. This doesn't mean we're going to go hit people upside the head with, you know, argument. We're going to love them and we're going to share the truth. We are the pillar and the support of the truth. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for today, and I thank you, God, for your instruction. And Father God, you saw fit to tell everyone in the world that would put their eyes in 1 Timothy chapter 3 how you hold church leadership. You're not messing around, and it is a high and lofty call. But it's because you use your church for great gain, and you've given us the best message that the world has ever heard. There's a lot of people talking, Lord, and they even talk negatively about your church. Help us, Father, to be found faithful. God, I know there are people in this room today that came from a family unit that was rough. But you've called us into your family. Help us to be your sons and daughters, mothers and fathers, grandmothers and grandfathers. Lord Jesus, we're going to eat. And we're going to see the kids are going to be running and screaming and it's going to be crazy and we're hopeful nobody gets knocked down. But what it's going to look like is a big family. Thank you, Lord, for calling us into your family. Praise you for your word today in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Amen, faith family. Have a great week.